This episode of the podcast is brought to you by New Bloom Labs. Cannabis producers that are creating innovative products with multiple cannabinoids need the best, most comprehensive potency analysis there is. And that's why they need to talk to the team at New Bloom Labs. New Bloom Labs understands the cannabis industry and what's important to growers, processors, and manufacturers. New Bloom Labs is leading the industry with potency testing of Delta-8, Delta-9, two isomers of Delta-10, and a dozen other major minor cannabinoids that are shaping the industry. They offer the fastest turnaround time in the industry, delivering most test results results in just one business day. So if you've ever questioned your lab's potency reports of your cannabis products, or if you're simply tired of waiting around for your test results to come in, then give New Bloom Labs a call at 844-TEST-CBD or visit their website at newbloomlabs.com. Superior science, rapid results, that's New Bloom Labs. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Cannabinoid Nation. Starting, managing, and scaling a cannabis or hemp business is highly complex, from keeping up with regulatory compliance to the importance of having adequate equipment such as water systems, lighting, nutrients, etc. Operators face challenges on the daily that can be overwhelming and in most cases not the best use of their time. Fortunately, the team of consultants and specialists at Cannabinoid Nation provide best-in-class industry solutions that aim to increase the likelihood of success for growers, processors, and manufacturers. Cannabinoid Nation is the industry's premier brokerage and consulting firm that helps cannabis and hemp operators with grow assessment consulting, white label, e-commerce, website design, website development, and digital marketing services. The company also has trusted relationships with retail buyers to ensure that growers and manufacturers they represent get the best price for their high quality products. Visit their website to learn more about their industry solutions at CannabinoidNation.com. Cannabinoid Nation, the cannabis industry's premier brokerage and consulting firm. Hello, my fellow people of the plant. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connect podcast, your favorite podcast that includes industry-facing conversations with the industry's leading experts that aim to educate and inform the public regarding the plant's endless benefits. My guest today is Jula Kongeja. He's the chief regional leader and president of Rotochrome North America. Jula, how are you, sir? Very well, thank you. Thanks so much for making time for me and my audience today. I'm looking forward to talking with you. I'm excited to be here. So tell us, what is Rotochrome all about? Rotochrome is an exciting uh, cutting edge technology that uh, our inventors uh, built over the past 14 years. It is a purification technology. So you can purify a wide range of uh, materials, whatever you want to really have a a better purity, better quality. Got you. And I know that, you know, that purification process is very important, particularly in the cannabis industry. So, you know, to kick things off, why don't we just start with the basic, you know, what chromatography is and, uh, and how it fits into this industry, as I mentioned. Sure. When people hear that word, you know, they, they get puzzled. What is it? What is it not? (laughs) And some people might have studied that in high school, You know, when you have a column as the typical starting point uh, with a stationary phase, some material, most often silica gel, then you would have your input material that you want to separate to pieces. And you would pour it in on the top and then you wait in the bottom that it comes out. The school example is when you're separating colors, right? You put in your input and it will be uh, coming in different times, different colors. Now that's a very difficult to scale process. And so chromatography is that art of separation, but the question is how fast you can do it and how well you can separate the different components that you are looking to separate. We call them compounds of interest, right? So that's the the basic of a chromatography is a column. Now, if you come to our technology, we made that column very tall, 33 feet tall. Now you don't wanna build a big building like that. So the next question is how can you do it differently? So we put it onto a rotor. And that's where it comes a little tricky. How would you fill a rotor with a stationary phase that is something solid, right? So that's where we have filled it with a liquid. People think, okay, I've got one liquid and I'm going to put another liquid. How will that work? So when, what what, what is it happening? Like you have the bucket full of water spinning above your head. I don't know if you've ever tried. (laughs) That stabilizes. Same way we, we load the system with some liquid, we spin it around and then it stabilizes what is not the equivalent of that solid that you would have in traditional columns. And then we push through the material that you need to separate and and purify. 
got you a lot more about it as we go forward so when you give that example of like spinning the bucket of water over your head it's just it's basically like the uh the gravity right like you're you're doing it at a speed where the water that's in that bucket is staying contained and, and is stabilized that way that's right that's right so you know there is a little bit more to it in our case and the science is about 40 years old but basically you get two liquids that you mix together which if you let them stand, they will separate out, like oil and water is the most basic, right? Mm -hmm. In the hemp cannabis industry, we often use hexane methanol water or, or heptane ethanol. But as soon as you leave those liquids on their own, they will separate, one becomes the upper phase, the other is the lower phase. So we use one of those to fill up the rotor and the rotor spins up. And people see the rotor, they think it is a centrifuge. It's not a centrifuge from a perspective that it doesn't separate for the speed. Right, it just needs to be spinning fast enough that it will stabilize that liquid just as just as you observe. Yes. Got you. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. And with with Rotochrome, from my understanding, y'all haven't always been, you know, in the cannabis industry, right? You've kind of served other other industries as well. And and so tell me kind of what that transition looked like into cannabis um, and, and why y'all decided to to serve this particular industry. Uh, it, it's an interesting, it's certainly an interesting transition. Our founders came from pharma and their story goes back probably, as I said, 14, 15 years ago, because the centrifugal partition chromatography started out as a laboratory science. So they went, visited some scientists in Western Europe and they said, okay, can this be made industrial? And they said, no, that's impossible. So certainly they wanted to prove them wrong, which <laughs> they've done. And uh, they created the smaller machine. We've got a small machine, which when I talk about small, it's still not on a, on a table. It takes about you know, three feet tall and 1,600 pounds heavy. But they created the small machine. And uh, coming to that, they said, OK, this will work well. And traditionally, when you use the original you know, laboratory research, it would be a couple of grams you can put in there. Ours, you can put in there 30, 40, 50 grams. Wow. Really, there are a lot to it, what you would do. But then they said, OK, how we can make it really industrial? So we scaled it up to the uh, to the what we call ICPC, industrial CPC. That's a 10 time multiplier. So you would think, okay, how is that 10 times? It's not 10 times length in the column, both of them. And that's the beauty of our system. We've got these two machines. The larger machine is about six feet tall and 4,000 pounds heavy, but both of them have the same column height and the larger has a little bit wider column. So that's how we made it happen that once you come up with something on the small, you can easily go 10 times. So now coming to this industry about three and a half, four years ago, a couple of folks realized that this is a much more effective way and cost effective way of separating materials because we don't have the, the stationary phase, the, the, the silica gel that you would need to throw away, right? So people came to us mostly in the US and they said, okay, can we apply your equipment? So we sold them the small machine and the large machine we said, okay, this is all good. You know, pharma industry would know how to handle solvents. These machines run about the small three gallons an hour, the large 30 gallons an hour. So you need to mix that solvent and you need to recover that solvent. So, you know, we didn't expect that those first few customers, they had good advisors, you know, some process engineers and said, I will help you mix and I will help you recover. Unfortunately, those early you know, promises from the market did not happen. You know, we did not have that equipment because pharma didn't need it. Empty so, promises. <laughs> yeah, they, but they, they had the good intention. They were sure. just going beyond their comfort zone. So gotcha. in 2017 and 18, we realized for this industry, we had to create the automation for mixing the solvents for the large machine and also helping them recover the solvents and it's, that's where it gets really important that whatever you put in, some of it you will consider valuable to you. The rest is not valuable. So in 2018, we came out with the solvent recovery solution for the not valuable stream. Uh, I don't like to call it waste because, you know, if it's THC, CBC coming together, some people decide to sit on it because they want to separate it later, right? Right. Some decide that yeah, I'm not going to deal with it. I just discard it as is immediately. But that's not our decision. We just give them a solution. Well, the reason why in 2018, we kept away from the fractions that include the compounds of interest, because there is this urban legend of CBD sensitive to 46, as it cannot be hot or not. So it's on you again. We solved the majority of the problems. So cannabis industry still tried. A lot of people, extraction companies use different evaporators. So we talked to many of them. They said, okay, can you recover our solvents? 
Now those are mostly ethanol recovery solutions. So it didn't really work. So we had to complete the solution for this, uh, for this vertical with the, with the two-stage solution. That's what we wrote out uh, end of 2018, 2019. So right now we have a complete solution. The solvent recovery for the fractions, the parts that include your compounds of interest have two stages. So we are utilizing the white film, which takes the solvent from about 90% to about 25, 30%. And then we finish with five rotor evaporators. We, you know, why would you invent something if it exists in the market? We had formed a strategic relationship with Heidolf, uh, the leading rotor evaporator provider for over 80 years of history. So that's how we now have a full solution that people can use in this industry. And that's just the technology side. I'll talk about the customers a little bit later if you are interested in that. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't imagine the R and D and all the work that went done, trial and errors in that in that time frame. That you know, that three to four year window that you mentioned of of trying to you know create a complete solution for that vertical, right? And so it sounds like with so much, um, you know, R&D and work that you've done within this particular vertical, is this a, ma a big focus for Rotochrome in the future, like cannabis is, or are you still going to have a focus on the pharmaceutical and other industries that you serve as well? Yeah, so, so we serve, you know, we've got customers in, in perfumes, molecules, separated molecules, we've got food and beverage. This certainly came up and with the hemp bill, a lot of people came to us. Going back to the sector, they were thinking, I buy a machine, I plug it in, you know, and gold comes out. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Right. So right now the customers are more sophisticated, right? Uh, that investment was not only for this vertical, where I really feel the value that we are enabling mid-sized companies to, who are on the edges, you know, innovating, but they try to disrupt traditional large companies to have that complete solution. And that's where we felt that it's not for that short window. And of course, there is always a window of opportunity that you work for, but it has a longer, much longer time frame. And also there is the regional and geographical delay, right? The US is much more advanced. Certainly Canada made the first you know, legalization decisions. So right. that was fast, uh, but there are Southern American customers who are picking up. Europe is not too much behind, but Europe is picking up and then we've got a number of requirements, uh, requests and inquiries from the East. So it's not a three year window, right? It, it, this is becoming the cash cow certainly in the, in the company's life. Mm -hmm. Some companies tell us, can we have even larger volumes? And then, you know, we talk about <laughs> the, the benefits of having something larger, which is great. Uh, you know, if you want to purify one thing in a huge volume, but you can create, you know, a thousand kilo per month on this machine, 2000, depending on what's your input material. So having 10 times, I usually ask, do you have any customers who will buy that from you? <laughs> right? And that's a really good question to ask, man, because, you know, everyone sees this industry as like the green rush, right? That everybody's ready to make all kinds of money and be successful. And you're right to the point, like you need to have those contracts in place. Sure. Like invest in the technology that you need, but make sure that the end product it will be sold. Right. Absolutely. And that, that's where my history comes in. I've, I've been in the US for over 15 years, but I was in strategy and operations consulting over 20 with, you know, blue chip companies like Deloitte, EY, Accenture, mm -hmm. spent a little time in Microsoft. So this was not on my plate when, when they asked me to build the North American market, but the current chief technology officer, and, they, and I know for 20 years, he said, hey, this is exciting. Come and help us grow the market. And, you know, I'm passionate about something that will make people's lives better. And that's where we saw CBD and all the miners and everything. Like, let's just get into it. And the customers three years ago were not the customers I'm used to with the <laughs> you know, Fortune 500 or 100. Right. Their, their, their approach, their assumptions were very different. But well, by now, I think, and that's, that's the, the challenge, you know, it, it changed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, there are those five states which approved last November, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. and, and there are a lot of delays. I think people who are delaying it, they have the assumption and the old images of who was in this industry. This industry is becoming more sophisticated as well. Absolutely. Very, very Absolutely. robust business plans, everything. So you know, it, is, it is exciting. It's exciting. It's, it's exciting to be in it and see the integration of the legacy operators because, of course, they, you know, they know the plant in and out. They know how to cultivate, to grow. 
And, but then you got the business savvy people coming in from different industries and it, it's, it seems like it's a really good cohesive relationship between the two, right? I'm, I'm sure that there's, you know, people that would complain and say that these, these people are trying to take over, or these people think they know everything, but really for the most part, I just see a great effort of collaboration across the board. And to your point, it's only helping the industry get more sophisticated, right? Yeah, you know, the, the challenge I think is the end consumer doesn't know who to trust. And, and you know, when I go into the store and the 100 milliliter bottle costs $150 and the other one is 80, am I getting half the content? Am I getting something I don't want to buy? You know, how do I trust it? So those who have the fully integrated channels at least are able to say, I'm controlling from seed to the shelves, right? But, but even in those tabs, the customer will scratch their head how can I trust this? And that's where I really appreciate all the regulatory requirements, the third mm -hmm. party testing. You know, that's where our solutions, uh, the most frequently used originally was the THC removal. And that's a very easy process. You know, when we come back to the, the machine, a typical run is 19 to 22 minutes. You pour in your input and a couple of minutes later, CBD starts coming out. And then towards the end, you know, the THC comes out. I'm oversimplifying because certainly we sure. can separate nine fractions. So people can, I want to separate CBG, CBN, all those, but people came for THC removal. That was mm -hmm. the $3,000 plus or $5,000 if it went to the, to the European market three years ago, right? Mm -hmm. But that's when you remember the CBN, CBG prices at the 70,000, the 40,000. <laughs> right. so okay, can I just change quickly? And that's the beauty that our machine because it liquid and every run you load that rotor with the liquid so it's consistent. Every run gives you the same output. Uh, when you use the silica gel, then you would have the first run, great. The second run, great. 10 run, 15 run, you know, the, the efficiency of that column will come to a point when the operator say, I need to throw it out. And mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the business decisions, I think people are making, how much am I paying for that consumables that I need to throw away versus our, the customers who set up our machine well, they buy fresh solvent once a year. Wow. So it's really, really a environmental friendly, more and more people care about that, but certainly money <laughs> and cost saving on, on, on doing that, right? right. But the, the change is you can run for three days something, you say, okay, now I want to do something else. And you just change your input and then off you go. That, that's the versatility of the machine. That's why customers who choose us, they know out of that hundred plus cannabinoids, they don't know what will be hot in a year, but they know that they will be able to utilize the equipment as the market shifts. And that is so important because you nailed it. I mean, we're just scratching the surface with understanding what these minor cannabinoids do. And um, it's it's almost going to be, in, in my opinion, like a flavor of the month type thing, right? We know that CBD is hot right now. People are talking about CBG, CBN for sleep. But in the future, you know, we're going to learn more about those, those compounds and having equipment that can easily help you pivot and focus on isolating or, or you know, primarily using that compound in different formulations is going to be key. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's where our customers, and we've got customers right now in eight states, uh, hopefully soon two more states will close. You know, how do you compete? It's because uh, some in the early beginning, as, as we talked about the real gamblers, they said, can I buy all your machines? I don't want anybody else to have it. <laughs> I said, okay, so if you're not going to use it, then what? How will that work? So I'm a firm believer of service competition, not on infrastructure. You know, if you have a Ferrari, I have a Ferrari, then let's see how, who can drive better. Not like right. I'm going to come with something else. And, you know, then we say we have a problem. In fact, right. when it comes to cars, we usually like to compare ourselves more to the Teslas because our machine is, you know, the, the limited supervision. The large machine is integrated to the level that you don't need to worry about it, right? Right. And but it also sounds, um, I mean, and I don't know your price points of the equipment, but it sounds like it would be cost effective because your target or your kind of sweet spot for your, your customers is the mid-size uh, mid companies, which you mentioned earlier, right? Uh, yeah, so large size companies we can serve, right? That's where we come to, you can buy multiple of these machines and run them in parallel and you can do one thing on one machine, another thing on another machine, or you can even daisy chain them that depending on what you produce, because these are called continuous batch processing. So we load it, the, the, the material gets separated, the machine purges itself and gets the next one in. Uh, the price point, it's an initial larger investment because of that consumables are lower. 
but certainly when you talk to anyone who you know offers financing and we do offer a selective financing as well for well-established companies you know they they make sense the break even is there and they say okay i'm not looking at trying to make it in a year i'm trying to look at for a long term what's my investment okay. uh, so that's that's where but we always mention the more valuable your output the shorter the return on the investment right so going back to some basic comparisons people come can i put in their crude i'm like yes this is a steel machine but why would you if your son plays soccer and he gets all muddy do you put the clothes into the washing machine or you rinse it first right 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 if you decide that you want to put in there the dirty one then you need to make sure that after four hours or one day you need to more often have the cleaning cycles to avoid build up build up of gunk mm -hmm. right if you have a higher purity input then you are running and you have maintenance once a week, once a month, depending on what you what you do. So these are all the decisions that people are like, oh, okay, but how how am I going to really operate it? And that's where we tell them, depending on what you want to do, you operate one thing or you want to be the leader because you invent others. So you can have, you know, a chemist. Some people do have an in-house PhD. It's not a requirement mm -hmm. you know, because we not only sell, but install and train the, the customers how to use these machines. But some people like to have a part-time chemist from a nearby university. Right. Say, I'm just consulting with them. There are a few of our customers who will say, I just wanna have recipes and I will sell those recipes to others. So there's different business models. So you guys actually like fulfill product, like white, is it white labeling that you do? If someone no, just so wants- we are not producing, right? We are okay. selling the equipment to gotcha. a buyer. Yeah. And then that buyer will create the space that's part of the other, you know, you need to have, this is industrial production. So you need to have an industrial space. Right. Depending on where you are in the middle of the city, it will be different than a rural area where the fire marshal wants. But they create the room. It's uh, usually a C1, D2 room. But again, the fire marshal, some want it in two rooms, some want it in one room, some doesn't care. Mm -hmm. But yeah, once the customer provides us the room, then we'll come and install the equipment and then we'll train the customer's operator how to operate it and their chemists how to make the, the formulas better. And that's where we go back to the what you are doing, right? You can put in the material and you can start diluting it. If, if the, the basic example, again, going away from this is if you have a 10 inch rubber band, you need to cut out half an inch from the middle, it's relatively easy. You need to cut out tenths of it, then you would start stretching it to the sides. And then you say, somebody hold it, I'll cut it in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. that, stretching is the dilution and the runtime. You said, okay, do I really want that two, you know, 1% from the middle? Is that valuable? Then you do it. Those so are the decisions when, that you make right before you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the customers will make a decision, you know, how, how pure I want. Uh, and then that's where the volumes go. I want non-detect. We truly create non-detect when it comes to THC removal. But wow. someday I also want to capture the fraction right after it, which will be compliant, still below the 0.3%, right? And then some say, you know, I, I, I will handle all the THC separately so they only collect the non-detect and sell it further. Mm -hmm. On the cannabis space, uh, a couple of years ago, we saw quite a bit of pesticides removal, right? Everybody was worried. These days, it's not so much, although it is flaring up again on, in the past uh, four months. Uh, it's different markets with different requirements. And that, that's just the same logic are, you know, and then I'm very proud of our chemists. We've got a great team uh, back in Hungary who has been studying different parts of the plant and, and all, this for, uh, all this field. They presented in the American Chemical Society's meetings. There was a, you know, very well received presentation on uh, pesticides removal from, from CBD. Now, if you take that as an example, here is your, you know, spectrum, CBD is in the middle. So any pesticides that is far away from it easy to remove. If it's close to it, it's more difficult. You need to stretch further. Right. As we go for THC, THC was at the end. So whatever was difficult for CBD will become easier. And what was at the end will become more difficult. Right. That's so true. that's where my research chemists say you can remove everything. And then the, then the economists say, but at what cost? Does it really make <laughs> financial sense? Right. Right. And then that, that analogy you gave of the rubber band is, is super visual and helpful um when you put it in those terms so so thank you for breaking it down that way are there any other differentiators that you think are worth calling out when it comes to rotochrome's technology compared to its competitors you know our technology as i mentioned has been built ground up for the scalability platform 
And that is, I think, super important. You know, if someone wants to jumpstart, you know, if you decide today that you want to sign my contract, we'll send you a machine next week. And then a week later, once it's installed, you can start putting your input in and that input can, you know, show you what are the valuable pieces. In the meantime, you will set up your room, right? Some people do it in a month, some in three months. I tell them if it's further away than six months, then wait, right? Uh, it would be a very expensive paperweight if you expect why did you see now and your room is not ready and, and I'm not a builder, right? Right. Uh, expensive paperweight. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That or, makes... or a beautiful room, room decoration. But right. And that happens when we exhibited at MJ Biz, right? People come to us and they say, is this an airplane engine? What is this? Right. So it is nice. Although when it's operating, the door is closed. Uh, in fact, people are not in that C1D2 room. But yeah. So so the big value that we provide is the speed to market, because by the time your room is ready, you will have your methods developed on the small machine and you transition and you know, okay, it is going to run. And while that is operating on a you know, limited supervision stage, you can continue on the small machine, either developing other methods, or if you collect certain smaller volumes, fractions from the large machine, you can use that small machine and, and utilize it for further separation. Gotcha. So I think that that scale approach is truly unique. We give you all the pre-sales consultation and hand holding. You know, even later on, you can call us and you know we will consult with you. People are right now in all exotic. What other things I can separate? And you know, if it's if it's green right now and if it's in a bush or a tree, if I cut it down, can I take something out of it? And, and we sign an NDA with every customer, so I can't really give you all the business ideas. <laughs> But there are a lot of things that are being separated by these machines. Well, we think about, you know, botany and zoology and plant life and whatnot and, and the terpenes and compounds within the plants. I mean, it's infinite, right? I mean, it, it's, it's pretty wild to think that machines like y'all's can actually extract those minor compounds to the most isolated level and then you know, put those into different formulations where they can actually benefit people. It's, it's really uh, remarkable. Absolutely. absolutely. You know, you mentioned terpenes. That's a hot topic uh, usually. And hot is there the key where you can separate terpenes by distillation. So I say there are cheaper ways to take it out. But, you know, if someone wants to play with it, again, not a good return on the investment. Uh, right. there, but there are folks who have been coming to us uh, in the past six months, <laughs> almost a year by now, who have been working in fermentation and they ferment their inputs and then they use that going through the machine and it's still related to the hemp space. Uh, so there, there, there are, that, that's where the chemists are out, right? Whatever right. you dream up and you wanna separate and, you, and your input is sensitive to temperature because the basic is distillation. You just warm it up and then it will, you know, leave the, the uh, material at different temperature. But here, our machines are working on room temperature. In fact, mm -hmm. that's one of the challenges with the small, small machine because we tell them, it is a machine that is on room temperature. If you come in at 68 Fahrenheit in the morning and you don't have air conditioning and it will be 75 by the afternoon, then those chromatograms shift a little. And you'll say, okay, but it's not the same. I said, okay, instead of two minutes, now you need to start at two and a half minutes. Why don't you just have the air conditioning? Now that's another problem that we solved for the large machine. It has heat jackets and is running on the same temperature. So it is constant, constant quality again. So those, those were, I think, the, the key elements that uh, people did not assume and, and you know the operators I tell them you dream up how you use it I just uh, use my mom's example who knows better than the washing machine right they say there are all those programs and she stops it in the evening and let it wait until the morning and she says now it will be cleaner but right. I don't recommend anyone stopping our machine we want to avoid that anything stays overnight in it right we just want to flush it but that's just the, the analog that a chemist will come up with a method a better system a better timing and that's how com companies compete. Right. Well, in that example, that just shows, you know, the added value proposition that Rotochrome brings to its customers in that, you know, in addition to the, the versatility, the scalability, you know, the innovative technology that the equipment is, you have that consulting aspect, right? You have experts that know the technology and can recommend the best approach and best options for, you know, a return on investment. Absolutely. So that's where you come. Okay, what sort of extraction you use, right? There are a number of competing extraction technologies. Those who use ethanol, uh, they usually keep 5% of the ethanol in their output because it's easier to move the material, right? Mm -hmm. and then they come to us and they say, okay, how much can we put through on the rotochrome equipment? 
will say, if you keep the ethanol in, then you likely want to go with ethanol and heptane as a solvent mix. But if you want a more effective method, then you go with the hexane methanol, which is you know, 20, 30% more efficient. But then you need to put an extra step in there just to take out all that ethanol. Right. And it's your decision. Are you going to save earlier on the process or later on? So that's why I'm always concerned when an investor comes without a process engineer who will say end to end, this is what we want to do. Because right. they will have those decisions which will ultimately will make or break the whole facility, right? Our equipment will be there in the middle, but how they use it is in their hands. Right. And it goes back to your example or what we talked about with, you know, you can, you can isolate and you can extract these compounds all day long with this technology, but if you don't have buyers, right, then you should really make sure that you have your ducks in a row, contracts in place, a, a plan of approach, right, before, before deploying or, or even, you know, moving forward. So um, it sounds like y'all are really end to end when it comes to those solutions. And so I, I want to switch gears a little bit. And you mentioned sure. earlier that, uh, you know, prior to entering the cannabis industry, you had experience working at Deloitte. Uh, what was the other company that you mentioned? EY, EY Accenture. EY Accenture, Microsoft, right? So tell me, how is cannabis different than traditional corporate America? Uh, you know, the, the company size, certainly we've got, although we've got very large companies as well, those are the, the rare occasions, right? The companies, the mid-sized companies, the investor is hands-on rolling up the sleeves and want to understand what we can do. And certainly there, it's very important that we've got the qualified technicians and chemists who make us credible, right? Uh, because those people are not the, the, uh, you know, I usually put people into or, or companies in these deals into four different categories. They are the economic buyers, right? They need to be comfortable how the business case will come together. But we need the technical buyers. And as soon as they bring it, then it's good. Some of them say, oh, it was just a chemist. I will bring someone. And then with the chemist, we together try to convince the investor, hey, this is what you need to consider. And, you know, don't believe me. Believe the chemist you are paying, you know, a nice salary for. <laughs> Right. So that's the technical buyer aspect. Uh, certainly in corporate uh, jobs, we, we have the influencers, right, who are a little bit further away, but they will influence the decision. Uh, here, because it's often smaller, you know, we, we rarely go with that. And in the very large companies, I've worked with coaches, which was the, the luxury when someone in the organization understands how the political landscape is, how uh, those other players are making their decisions, where they are in the annual cycle. You know, in a large corporation, as the, the year end comes, they say, I had my budget. If I don't spend it, I'll lose it. You know, I, I haven't seen that much in this industry that people are rushing their decisions because someone will take away the money. Right, uh, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't that, imagine that's happening yet, right? Because it's, it's we're at the forefront. I mean, everything's happening now. But, but that works backwards with, with the states where they are delaying, right? People make their plans and they say, okay, I'm going to get a loan and I'm going to use my personal property as collateral. And if the opening of the market is delayed, then they are in big trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Their access to capital is different. And then not to mention, if you go to the cannabis guys, cash-based businesses, uh, all, all the concerns of how you can send money. In the, initially, we were selling this equipment from Hungary all over the world. I established uh, the Rotochrome North America subsidiary. So now it's easier for them. They don't need to spend, you know, send money internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, th those were, again, for a corporation, it was no issue where you send money. For, for companies in this space, it was a little bit of a headache. Right now, it's not an issue anymore. Right. Building out that North American um, business arm within Rotochrome, for lack of a better word, uh, what was that like? I mean, I can't imagine the challenges that you experienced trying to get that program running. I worked in, in those professional services companies in Europe for about 10 years before I came here, right? So I, I understood the business and that was 15 years ago. So I, I was cautious. Uh, originally, I, uh, I was looking for people who understand the Hungarian culture. Our VP of product development in the US is somebody who is a Hungarian. I'm very proud of him. He used to run Google Hungary when Google started in Hungary. And wow. he came to join my team because he was excited in the 
big data, how we can make this a smart machine, right? But he spoke Hungarian and he understood the language. And then a couple other folks, I had someone else who is RVP of operations, who is from uh, the, the boutique strategy houses because of this consultative approach, how we are going to sell and deliver. Uh, you know, th those are very important for me. And I got the criticism, hey, why don't you hire people who don't speak Hungarian? And I told them, even I had culture shock working with the Hungarian team of 15 <laughs> years, making assumptions which were different, right? And right. that's a weird feeling, but if you work with someone, someone from Germany, from Italy, from Hungary, even within Europe, they will have different styles. Sure, cultural differences. Yeah, that's the business fair. culture yeah. as well. So the Europeans would be even today much more detailed in making these these uh, decisions. The Americans. We had a couple of customers who were very much gamblers, and they made quick decisions to speed to market, and and that's just the nature of it, right? right. Uh, I also had the the uh, <laughs> other experiences as I said three four years ago. You know, people are trying to make decisions on Snapchat and, you know, WhatsApp and <laughs> okay, can we please channel this to, uh, uh, to email, email. <laughs> yeah, at a bare minimum. We certainly right. have DocuSign for, for, you know, documents, but, but working with the Hungarian team, I had to create that cultural buffer of just bear with us. Right now we've got, you know, our VP of technical services is someone who doesn't speak at all Hungarian. We've got some uh, other folks in the sales team who don't speak Hungarian. Uh, so, you know, we, we are shifting there, but that's again the next question, because this company was a Hungarian company looking to serve the world, and right now we are building an international company, right? So we had to shift and a lot of the internal communications shifted to English, not only customer facing documents. Uh, that, that, that was part of it. It's a so lot it's of work. It's a lot of work, right? <laughs> Well, and so you touched on, you know, the focus on on being an international company uh, and serving all global markets. So let's let's build upon that. So what what are the big focus? We're in Q two of twenty twenty one. What is the the remainder of your plans for this year and uh, and the future? Sure, um, I'm very proud that we opened a reference facility in Denver, Colorado, with How Processing. You know, that was a major step. Uh, as I went back to who has our equipment, right? People who bought our equipment, they did not want to talk about it. They said, I want this fastest machine, but I don't want others to know. Even mm -hmm. when we talk to customers, say, tell me the city, I will know who is your customer. I'm like, that's why I'm not telling you the city, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, but people say, is there anybody around me in this state? Am I alone, right? And so we, as, as I mentioned, Montana and Utah are two, city, two states where we only have one customer in each, right? So if you are an investor, you want to come into those states, you will have more chances than in the California and in Oregon and, you know, North Carolina or some other places. But so I'm very proud that we managed to open that facility. Uh, we have a couple other facilities that we are looking to open so people don't need to travel, especially with COVID. You know, we did a couple of these one-to-one -one, uh, uh, video virtual visits. Sure. But the customers can come and visit. And in parallel, we've got... Uh, very close to release, but I can't talk about it yet, uh, discussions and collaborations with universities. So as I mentioned, this science is about 40 years old and not many universities teach CPC, the, the centrifugal partition chromatography. So we'll need two sets of university collaborations. One is on the applied chemistry and people are able to learn it. And then we, we had a couple of these. I'm very happy from the Northeast. Someone, a last year chemistry student says, Hey, I'm looking to go to this new cost, new company, and I already called their attention to your technology. So we'll need those, and then oh. we need the other one, which is advancing the science, right? To, to take it further of where it can go in a number of ways. So we have collaborations: uh, one in the West Coast, one in the in the Midwest, uh, South. I'm hoping that we will be able to announce them those soon, and you know that will again take the science further. Uh, mm -hmm. It is it is an exciting space. And uh, I think as everybody is getting vaccinated, you know, people will be more mobile. You know, we haven't been on an in-person show for a long, long time. The, the upcoming show in Austin, uh, I, I, I told our guys, if you get vaccinated and you are comfortable, you can go. Certainly I'm not pushing anyone to take that risk. Sure, but sure. We'll in-person shows as well. 
Right. No, I, 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 I totally hear you. Yeah. I mean, the more that we can, like you said, get vaccinated, get back to some type of normalcy where we can be in person is huge because it's not the same, you know, doing, I mean, it's nice to be able to do it with technology and have live streams and live events, but to be in person, there's just something more to that, you know? Um, Absolutely. And you know, when, when, when people come and they can touch the machine, they say, wow, this is, this is something that I'd really love to have. And, you know, it is, it is also an impressive uh, uh, experience to, to see the facility in person, you know, and going back to the shows, we had several hundred uh, leads from all the, all the MJBs in the fa past few years. We tried the number of the virtual conferences. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, quite far <laughs> if I'm sugarcoating the experience <laughs> and the effectiveness of those compared to the in-person. Well, sure. What you said makes so much sense. I mean, being in person and seeing those machines firsthand and looking up at the how big they are and how innovative the technology is and being able to touch it. I mean, there's there's no replacement for that, you know, uh, so that that makes sense. What, one last question to wrap things up is have y'all raised capital at this point? And if not, do you plan to do so? And other question is any plans to go public at any point? So we have an investor from Hungary, G and B partners are our investors and they gave us a second round of investment uh, almost a year ago by now. Uh, certainly that gives us the financial stability. You know, we are, we, we had uh, very steep growth in 2017, 18, and 19, and with COVID that slowed down. Uh, so, you know, that was an important element. We have had the plans and the ambitions to go public, uh, but I can't tell you the time frame right now. <laughs> we are not taking investors at this point, although people love to invest early on, right? That's in right. The interest of, uh, of the uh, big benefits of the going public. That's right. That you see, you know why I asked. See, I'm, I'm already eyeing. I want to see what your guys' ticker is. When are you going? When are you going public? <laughs> uh, not, 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 not in the short term, right? So that's where it is again an interesting how you set up such a company. Going back to my corporate background, I worked with companies, uh, you know, pre-acquisition, post-acquisition, helping them go on the stock exchange in Europe and and even in the U.S. And you know, that's that's a process where. We need to see how we will position. Is this a Hungarian company going into an international exchange? Are we going to have an American company going into an American exchange? You, you, the, the lawyers make a lot of money and the accountant <laughs> by the time we make all this uh, you know, properly set up. Right. They let you have all those uh, difficult internal discussions and then they just... They represent you at the end, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But you know, my, my, my ambition is that Customers who are buying end product would need to know that this this was purified on Rotochrome. So certainly, even now we have our our training programs, and we require that the employees of the customer will take a course, and they are certified in running our machine. Right? That that would assure you that if you buy any product that came off from Rotochrome equipment, will meet a certain quality expectation that you want to pay for. Uh, that's that's where we are positioning this and for for those you know we have a number of considerations how we will put it together and and you know grow further yeah right. <laughs> awesome well hey this has been a very informative conversation I've, I've really enjoyed it i know that the audience has gotten a lot out of it so uh where can people find y'all's website and social media if they wanted to learn more or follow up and, and inquire about the equipment the, the easiest is rotachrome.com Right, so that's our go-to page. We have uh, launched at the end of last year a series of webinars. So on the web page, you can see the previous webinars. You can register and replay those. Uh, we have uh, a, a you know semi semi busy uh, uh, LinkedIn activity, and certainly not so busy Instagram yet. <laughs> uh, we have been on Instagram. Uh, we see that a lot of our customers and a lot of players in this business are on Instagram. Uh, you know, when, and we have a Facebook page that uh, we connect with our customers, but the easiest is our web page and subscribe to our newsletter, subscribe to our, our podcasts. Uh, the every webinar is followed by a podcast where we are getting some additional, uh, you know, discussion points and questions that were not answered at the end of the webinar. So, you know, we, we try to utilize the technology as much as possible, given that we've got great in-house talent. 
Yeah, it's so important to leverage that technology just because this space is so new, it's highly complex, and education is really what's going to help us move the needle both on the consumer front and just as an industry as a whole, you know. So great to hear that y'all have a podcast and different platforms where you're educating your consumer base. So uh, Jula, really appreciate it again. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, you know, as the industry continues to evolve, let's let's have you back on so we can talk about all the uh, the great things that y'all are doing at Rotochrome. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes. And thank you all for listening. Bye. Bye.